Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this point-in-case session, which is entitled Revolutionizing Coronary Calcium Treatment, Unleashing the Potential of Intravascular Lithotripsy, and it's sponsored by Shockwave Medical. Now, what is the problem that we have to face nowadays? Our biggest enemy in interventional cardiology is calcium. And we have learned over time, in particular, with respect to intercoronary imaging, that there are different patterns of calcification. They could be superficial, they could be deep, they could be focal, they could be circumferential. And this is the major issue which we have to face. This is the excess, a napkin ring-like appearance of superficial closure calcium ring. So, the even more pronounced problem is if we have eccentric calcifications, where only part of the vessel circumference is diseased, and if this calcium then is protruding as a nodule, this is maybe the most difficult scenario to treat. And what we have learned over the last five years is that we have a new tool in our hands that allows us to address these kind of different levels of calcification, which is intravascular lithotripsy. And as I've mentioned, this year it is celebrating its fifth anniversary. Now, the objectives of that session are first to understand the mechanism of action of intravascular lithotripsy for the treatment of calcified lesions. Second, to uncover practical tips and techniques for IVL in challenging calcified lesions. And in particular, we would like to emphasize on the scenario of eccentric calcified lesions. And third, to learn how to safely utilize IVL in left main bifurcation scenarios. This is your facilitating team. So apart from me, the two spokespersons, uh, Davinda Shatta and Michael Lee, and then our three presenters, Marco Weinstein, Ashok Set, and Yuchim Tan. So the flow of the session will be that Marco is giving us an introduction into the fundamentals of intravascular lithotripsy and its unique mechanism of action. Ashok then will present us cases and how to treat eccentric calcium, and uh, Eugene will address the aspect of calcified uh, distal left main bifurcations and the treatment options that IVL is going to offer us. And finally, I'm happy to wrap up this session. So having said that, Marco, I would like to ask you to give your first presentation on the mechanism of action of IVL. Uh, thanks a lot for being here. It's my privilege to represent Brazil all the way uh, to Singapore. And uh, I think in the next few minutes, I'm going to share with you the fundamentals of intravascular uh, lithotripsy and its unique mechanism of action. This is my disclosure. So I'd like first to briefly start with the, uh, uh, stressing the prognostic impact of severely, uh, severely calcified coronary lesions. There is still, as we know, an um, unmet clinical need. And why? Mainly because PCI of heavily calcified lesions is associated with procedure complications and late adverse events. Uh, calcium increases the safety risk of the procedure, impedes stent deliver deliverability, and mainly prevents stent expansion, leading to restenosis and instant thrombosis. This is a brief analysis of over 6,000 patients. And when you look only to the left, to death, you can see that when compared to non-severely calcified lesions in, in, uh, in red, you see in the blue line, the patients with severely calcified lesions has twice as much uh, mortality rate when, uh, when compared to the others. So lithotripsy, uh, it's not new. It started over 30 years ago, uh, it's mainly for, used for uh, kidney stone ester and in um, extracorporeal fashion. But intravascular lithotripsy came more recently, uh, about five years ago, as Professor Hart just mentioned in, the, in his presentation. It, this is based in miniaturized array emitters in a balloon, localized in a, in a balloon that will provide sonic pressure waves. The newest generation of the coronary lithotripsy catheter is the C2 plus catheter. I was told that it's not available yet in Singapore. 
is not also not available in some countries, but it's going to be soon available. And the main difference of the C2 plus and the C uh, catheter is the number of pulses. Otherwise, they are the same. The C2 plus catheter has two emitters that will be able to emit 120 pulses instead of the uh, usual 80 pulses only. But they are both uh, uh, mounted in a in a 12 millimeter length balloon and that ranges in diameter from 2.5 to 4 ohm and they're, all, they're always uh, compatible with a 014 inches system uh, gu um, guide wire. <clears throat> this is a quick demonstration. Let's see if we have the sound. To modify coronary calcium in a predictable, safe, and consistent manner. It consists of a generator, connector cable, an intuitive catheter, Shockwave C2+, which houses two lithotripsy emitters enclosed in a 12 millimeter balloon. So bear in mind that the sonic pressure waves travel through the vessel within an effective pressure of roughly 50 atmosphere compared to a regular balloon. Another unique mechanism of action that has to be stressed is that the high-speed sonic pressure waves created safely inside the integrated balloon. When uh, unfocused lit lithotripsy energy is created at the emitters which are con containing the fluid, and electrical energy is delivered uh, to the emitter, initiating a steam bubble which eventually expands and collapses, creating the, uh, the sonic pressure waves. I think this is the most interesting feature of, the, uh, of uh, uh, shockwave. IVL uh, in, is designed to minimize trauma while cracking the calcium compared to other, um, other forms of uh, calcium modifications like uh, rotation arthrectomy and orbital arthrectomy. So when you look to, to the left, you're going to see that the large difference in density between uh, the fluid and the balloon causes the calcium-like ma ma material to fracture. When, when you look to the right, and you, uh, the sonic pressure waves safely propagate through uh, the soft tissue, like blood or the vessel, with no damage to the minimal, uh, due to the minimal difference in, the, in, in density. In terms of fractures, uh, when you compare to balloon only that produces compressive uh, uh, fractures, IVL is able to, co to, to create compressive force plus shear stress and tensor uh, uh, stress, which is much more efficient in terms of fracturing the calcium. And finally, bear in mind that the OCT, the regular OCT, definitely mi uh, might underestimate the presence, the presence of calcium fracture. When you compare to micro OCT that is capable of seeing 90% of fractures, OCT uh, only is uh, capable of seeing less than half of it. So if you don't see a fracture in OCT, it doesn't mean that it, doesn't, it didn't happen. So and, uh, to finalize, as a take home message, I wanna uh, uh, leave to you that calcium is likely the main obstacle for a successful PCI because it limits the stent deliverability and full expansion, potentially resulting in thrombosis and restenosis, as mentioned before. Shockwave emit sonic pressure waves that travel to the vessel wall with an effective pressure of uh, greater than 50 atmospheres. Shockwave IVL fractures both superficial and deep calcium, and sonic pressure waves cause no damage to the t soft tissues to the minimal di uh, difference in density. That's, uh, that's what I have to present now. I think we can move on. Well, thank you, Marco. So please, in the audience, if you Mark, you can stay over there. We have some minutes of question and answer. So the audience might use your app in order to send us your questions, and we're more than happy to answer them. While you do so, I may start. Marco, so, some colleagues, sometimes when you talk to them uh, about IVL, they say this is a quite bulky catheter, and if you have a very tight calcified lesion, it is very easy, if not impossible to advance it to that calcified lesion. What is your experience, your personal experience with the trackability of that device? For you. Okay, I thought you said it's Michael. For you. It's for you. Did you, uh, did you hear my me. question? Okay, I, I, I thought oh, it was, uh, you were addressing I'm the very question sorry to my me. old friend Michael. We were friend, we had four yeah. colleagues together a long time ago, right? Uh, we, have, we did we have our many fellowship Michaels here. together in Boston <laughs> 22 years ago. Uh, 
So it's my privilege to see Mike here. So I think this is a real problem. The, the balloon uh, is bulky, and uh, but um, you have to sometimes, very often actually, to prepare the lesion to use the balloon, uh, the shockwave balloon. But I, I changed completely my personal algorithm of treating calcified lesions. That mantra that says that when the balloon doesn't cross the lesion, you need to use rotation atherectomy, for me, is totally wrong nowadays. Because sometimes you even need to, uh, to cross with the, the microcatheter sometimes is, diff is, is very difficult. Sometimes, then I prefer to cross the lesion, even if it's very tight, with a very, very small 1.0 1, 1 balloon and create a little hole and then sometimes upgrade 1.5 or 2 and then go with the shockwave balloon. Eventually, this is uh, successful in most of the circumstances, but in very seldom I have to use both rotoblator uh, before shockwave to get access to the, to the balloon. A any other uh, tips and tricks in order of that? What's about selection of guiding catheters and uh, guide extensions? Yeah, uh, in terms of guiding catheter, uh, you're going to need uh, good support. It doesn't need, if it's radio or not, uh, some, I think 90% of the times we use radio, but with the, this Lander 7 French Chief uh, radio, you, if you believe it's going to be a very uh, tortuous vessel, you can use a 7 French guide even through the radio, and uh, extension guiding catheters can be used uh, because it's compatible. Uh, even the 4.0 balloon is compatible with the, guide, uh, the GuideZilla um, uh, for a sound French. Yeah. I, I think since we have no question at the moment from the audience, I think it is important to emphasize that this IVL balloon is just a pure application balloon. It's, it's not a dilatation balloon. So the question is then, do you always post dilate once you have done the IVL before you stent the lesion? Or it, do you feel if the balloon is completely open without any waste, you can go for directly stenting that lesion? Well, okay, for me. Uh, well, in terms of uh, uh, pre-dilation, as I said, uh, uh, this, this, these chances are greater than 90% that you're gonna have to predilate unless the lesion is not severely calcified because if you are not predilating, probably you don't need a shockwave. So you must predilate before you use shockwave. Uh, in terms of post dilation, it depends a lot on the result. Um, in about 50% of the cases, after using shockwave, you still need to do a post dilation, but in f about 50% you don't need. If the result is okay and the stent is it's possible to deliver the stent or, or a drug coating balloon after using shockwave, you don't need to post dilate. But after stenting, definitely you need to post dilate. I thought your question is post dilate immediately after shockwave, right? So exactly. immediately after shockwave, in less than 50% or roughly 50% you post dilate. But after implanting the stent, in 100% of the cases you have to post dilate. Mm -hmm. And maybe the final question from my side to you. Um, we have with the C2 catheter 80 pulses to deliver totally, with the new one, the C2 plus 120. So do you always deliver all pulses, even if you see that the balloon is completely open after 20, 40, 60 pulses? Or do you go for less, if you see the balloon is open, done, take it out and throw the rest of pulses to the rubbish box? This is a very good question, Professor Hod. I think I thought this question would come anyway. So. Uh, it depends, again. If, if the lesion is a very uh, focal lesion and proximal lesion and you don't need to, to do it in distal uh, lesions, you can, and, and the result is okay with, let's say, 40 or 60, uh, 50 pulses, you can stop, you know, right? Especially in the left main, where you have to be more cautious about using in the left main. Uh, probably going to address this later. I saw that there is some issues with the left main. And I think left main is a, is a chapter apart. You have to discuss uh, how to use in the, in the left main. Otherwise, I try to use the 80 pulses all, most of the times uh, to distribute them all of the time. Uh, I'm not, I didn't use the 120 pulses yet because it's not available in Brazil. I would just post that question to the round. Michael, all pulses or only as many pulses as you see the balloon is open? I, I, if I'm sure I would not use it again. For the rest of the procedure, probably I will deliver all the pulses just to be uh, sure yeah. that the calcium is adequately cracked. Yeah. Yuchim. All pulses. Why yeah, waste it? I think invariably these patients come with uh, 
uh, triple vessel disease. So I, I think your pulses have to be kind of graded as per the severity of the disease and the distribution of calcium in the vessel. Imaging helps in that regard. And you will have certain segments which will have very thick plate calcium. So in those areas, you can consider it and give more. <coughs> so grading of pulses before you start the therapy is very important. And distal to proximal principle has to be followed because balloon is a very high profile balloon and you'll find it very difficult to push it back inside. So it's very important you start from distal come to proximal. Two important things which predict stent expansion post IVL are one is fractures and second is dissections. These are two important things. So we must also along with IVL post IVL use some cutting balloons. You know, you need to produce some dissections so that helps. And displacement of the fractured segment, I mean the calcium fragments which you've created with the IVL, the displacement of this only is going to predict the expansion. So dilatation after the IVL therapy with pre-dilatation is very, very important. So I, I think I thought I'll make these two points. Ashok, also the same question to you. Yeah. And Just I to won't specify, well, I one specify. lesion, one lesion. Don't take the pulses home. Deliver them all. I've <laughs> okay. been caught by that, Clear not message. delivering all the pulses. The same I do. The same I do, if you want to get my message. Marco, I have to thank you very much. Okay. We need to continue you. now. Ashok, my pleasure. It's your turn. We are moving to the special scenario of eccentric calcified lesions, in particular nodular calcified lesions. And Ashok is going to tell us whether and how IVL can help us in that particular scenario. Ashok. Thank you. I had a scare this morning because my computer crashed. And I finally got the slides again from, from uh, my secretary from India. So I have them now downloaded and well. Uh, unleashing the potential of IVL, here my conflicts. Uh, the real world severely calcified lesion is a different scenario altogether. So it's not the CAD 3, CAD 1, 2, 3 type, type stuff that we end up dealing with. These are bifurcations, left main, LV dysfunction, uh, uh, previous uh, uh, TAVI done going through the struts for a left main bifurcation. Nodular calcium, a recurrent uh, uh, restenosis, uh, calcified restenosis, and so forth. So while we have a variety of devices of treatment of severely calcified lesions and often go to device synergy, in the, in the whole scenario spectrum of, uh, of uh, our devices, these are in patients with mal massive calcium burden. We obviously use advantages of multiple devices. But IVL is safe, effective, and most user-friendly device for the treatment of severely calcified lesions. Now, we call them eccentric if they're less than 180-degree arc. We call them concentric if they're greater than 180-degree arc. And they respond differently. There's no question around it. Now, we've also learned the fact that uh, if it's eccentric, perhaps you can dilate with a balloon and you can good, get good MSAs. But there are limitations to that, especially if you have very nodular calcium or you have thick plate eccentric calcification along a longer length of the lesion. So we must keep this in mind. Now, there are a number of studies which compare IVL in eccentric and concentric lesions from the CAD database, pool level analysis, and others. And what that tells you is less fractures are visible in the eccentric group versus the concentric group as far as imaging is concerned. The acute gain, however, and the final MSA are not significantly different, and we're talking about standalone IVL, and clinical outcomes are also the same. So, so perhaps IVL does improve compliance through microfractures and other mechanisms which help dilatation of the vessel, and more recently, uh, Ziad Ali published this data around the patterns of impact of IVL on calcified nodules showing its efficiency in achieving LMAs, mean stent areas, mean stent areas, and acute gains in nodular calcium versus non-nodular calcified disease. Now I want to actually tell you the tips and tricks for eccentric, heavily calcified, thick plate calcium. Now, we understand that the greater the arc of calcification, the greater the efficacy of the pulses. That has to be well understood, because if there's eccentricity, there's going to be dissipation of pulses in the non-calcified area. And yet, if there's concentricity, there's no dissipation of pulses. And therefore, a greater number of pulses have to be delivered in eccentric calcification than in concentric calcification. That's well understood. 
The second poison point is size the balloon appropriately in eccentric calcification. You will well understand that you need to be opposed to the calcium. If it's concentric, even a smaller size balloon compared to the artery will oppose and ad be adjunctive to the calcium to fr fracture it. However, if an eccentric calcium, a smaller size balloon may leave areas which are unopposed to the calcium, thereby being ineffective. The third point, very importantly, is understand that the emitters are the, are the site of maximum impulses. Two, six, and four, starting proximally, the first emitter is at two millimeters, there's a six millimeter gap, and then there's a four millimeter gap to the edge of the balloon. These are the maximum area of impulses, and I would normally place my proximal emitter at the ex most eccentric part of the lesion itself. Deliver most pulses at the eccentric lesion. Judge the area, and then I think it's a good idea that after rotational atherectomy, if you actually do balloon dilatations, you pick up those areas which actually may require the maximum, if you want to use an IVL after, after uh, you can see the undilatable areas and deliver your pulses mostly at those areas after calcium modification. Imaging is essential for vessel sizing, for luminal gain, and to reveal, and it's not for visible fractures, believe you me. That's not the concern. As you saw, even micro fractures will lead to compliance of the vessel. But IVL improves compliance, so for me, it's more an issue around safety, and importantly, do not chase residual stenosis in an eccentric lesion, but achieve the final MSA, and that's why imaging is ex extremely important. So we never chase eccentricity. We actually chase the luminal gain in such cases. And of course, C2 IVL catheter is absolutely an, a, a marvelous tool for eccentric and nodular calcium. Now let me show you some cases. Here's a case which came to me after it had been done at another center where this heavily calcified vein graft had been rotablated, followed by stent implantation, followed by non-compliant balloon. There were areas of new stenosis, but there were also areas of under-expanded stent and nodular calcium protruding through the stent struts. This is how the, the IVL works. After cutting balloon dilatation to remove away any fibrous tissue which may have formed inside, this is followed by a 3.5 mm, millimeter IVL. Most of the pulses are delivered at the nodule and the under-expanded stent at the proximal area. That's where my 80 pulses went, with the nodule getting really 30, 50 of those 30, uh, 80 pulses. Here's what happens. The nodule gets fractures on either side, as you actually can see. You see these fractures, and there are some fractures going through the stent, outside the stent followed by an OP and NC at 40 atmospheres to expand that underdilated segment of the stent, which was the proximal part of the stent, and you have mild residual stenosis after that, followed by a drug-coated balloon, but the images are great because that shows the nodules now pushed out, pushed out of the stent, which can happen. Because of these fractures on the side of the nodule, you actually have deep fractures outside, and we've expanded the seven stent, which had an area of 2.5 or something, which was expanded after IVL to around 4.5 is now 7.25. And I think that's what's very exciting about this. But the C2 plus has been a great addendum. For example, you have this case, which is 80-year-old, triple vessel, main bifurcation, EF 30%, PS sats are low, uh, and therefore a creatinine clearance, which is poor. And obviously, this is what he has on the left side, a left main bifurcation, highly eccentric calcium, you can see that, and then there's distal disease as well out here, all the way down, but you also have RCA, which is calcified. IVL on the RCA, this is C2 plus catheter, I delivered 30 pulses because I could see on, 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 on the IVAS that I could get away with lesser pulses on the RCA. A four millimeter IVL treated, 30 pulses on this side, look at the lumen gain that I have on, on the RCA with 30 pulses. Now I have my 90 pulses for the left side, and I'm going to use that four millimeter on the proximal segment. So I use rotational atherectomy for the distal segment. And therefore, of course, it's a balloon uncrossable. Use rotational atherectomy all along till the distal segment. Take some volume away also from the circumflex. And now I have an efficient IVL, which helps me, the four millimeter same IVL has 90 pulses left. And I'm able to treat the left pain, the proximal LED, and one more pulse onto the circumflex till I finish the 120 pulses right in the left main. 
Well, the distal LED could be easily stented after rotational atherectomy, and that's why I didn't have to use another IVL here. And after having done that, we actually therefore do a bifurcation stenting, and all this is, of course, as you can see, done mechanical circuitry support. And that's a perfect result, but if you actually see those images, this was the most eccentric area, and you actually have a 10.04 square millimeters at that particular point. And finally, another C2 case, 80-year-old gentleman, 35% injection fraction, acute decompensated heart failure, recent pulmonary edema, diabetes, and hypertension. He has this left main bifurcation disease. We know that these are highly eccentric lesions, both down the circumflex in the proximal segment and in the LED, but there's also distal the circumflex disease. But then that's taken care of. You can see the extent of disease process and the calcified disease process and eccentric nodular calcification, which you'll see later. After stenting the distal, we have this heavy calcification in the posterior segment. Prior to IVL, I always do pre-dilatation, but here in this case, you have the IVAS, you show circumferential calcification, your eccentric nodular calcification is seen, and therefore IVL at 3.5, and again, deliver the 60 pulses at that most eccentric part of the calcium. I take the, uh, take the IVL, which is a C2+, plus, give 20 more pulses here, give 20 pulses into the circumflex ostium, then come back and give more pulses into the left main at that particular point. After a total of 120 pulses, I'm able to dilate that area with a non-compliant balloon at high pressures. And that's what it takes. It, my, my mini crust tenting to the LED diagonal bifurcation and a pot results in an excellent result in this case. So I won't take this any further because there are numerous cases one can demonstrate, but clearly the message is more pulses in an eccentric lesion is absolutely what will get you may not be fractures, may be fractures at the edges, but compliance of the vessel to achieve large MSAs. And our end is MSA on imaging has to be the end rather than just the ellipticity or eccentricity. Be safe, but don't be sorry. Now we have the C2 plus catheter to enable these nodal and heavily eccentrically calcified lesions. Thank you very much for your attention. Ashok, thank you very much. Great presentation, great cases. Again, for the audience, please send us your questions. We're more than happy to answer them. Ashok, I would practically ask you, that the big challenge is the calcified nodule. First of all, to identify it, and second, then, to apply exactly the energy of the IVL catheter to that nodule. How do you practically do that? First of all, how to identify, always intercoronary imaging, always together, with co-registration on the ANGIO to know where you work or you have to work in the ANGIO, and then how do you do it with the IVL catheter? Because the emitters are not well visible, at least not with my eyes in my cath lab, and it's a brand new one. So Michael, you're, you're, you're absolutely right, and many of these calcified nodules won't even allow your imaging catheter to go through in the first instance. But the identification I prefer for a calcified nodule is, for me, better on OCT than IVAS. And we all understand that IVAS is difficult to interpret in many calcified nodules. You can't actually see behind the calcium. It's like a protrusion there, which is heavily calcified. Of course, angiogram gives you some guidance around it, because if you've got heavily calcified vessel with filling defects, it's more likely not to be a thrombus, though thrombosic calcified nodules do exist. It's more likely to be calcified nodules. If you can't cross it, you rotoblate it. If you can't cross it with an imaging catheter, I use OCT, I would identify it. But if my guide wire biases were towards the calcified nodule, as seen on imaging, I would then go in with an atherectomy device and debulk the nodule. The preferred atherectomy device in could be uh, uh, to orbital atherectomy to get more of that volume of calcium away in a nodule versus, versus rotational atherectomy if the guide wire biases were correct. I would then go in that area and deliver practically most of my pulses at that particular point. You saw the way compliances and fractures work. After that, I would do a balloon dilatation. I would not do, I could do an imaging to understand whether I had actually had any fractures, but for me, that's not the end point. For me, it's, a no, it's an optimal size balloon at high pressures seen in two orthogonal projections. I would then implant a stent if I saw that, that there was no great degree of restal stenosis. 
And then I would just look at the MSAs, knowing that I would have a residual stenosis in one view or the other, but not concentrically, but I would achieve large MSAs. And large MSAs for me in practical terms means at least six in the mid-LAD, at least seven, not 5.5 and 6.5, at least five in the mid LED, five, six in the mid LED, and seven on IVAS, and on OCTs, I would aim for more than five in the mid LED, and more than 6.5, or six or 6.5 in the OSTIF. Thank you. Thank you, Ashok, for this extensive and in-depth uh, answer. You, you mentioned the ablative technologies. We have the rotablator, we have the orbital atherectomy. Can you give us your view how these both ablative technologies can play a role in the treatment of calcified nodules, in particular calcified nodules. Correct. And I think they have a role. Uh, they have a role. Uh, we've never known how many pulses to deliver in a calcified nodule to get the best, best results, uh, though it's been demonstrated that you can get large MSAs even in calcified nodules with, 100, uh, with 80 pulses. But uh, I do believe for nodules, uh, you need to actually have uh, uh, decreased the volume of calcium burden prior to any fractures and compliance uh, modifications. And therefore, I, I actually prefer orbital atherectomy just for the sake of greater ablative and greater calcium volume reduction prior to IVL. But I will all the time use, uh, use device synergy for calcified nodules uh, most often than just a single device, which therefore means uh, uh, rotational atherectomy, but preferably, preferably for me, orbital atherectomy followed with IVL. Okay. Ashok, I think I thank you very much. We have no thank question you. from the audience at the moment, so I think we can proceed now to the last presentation. You, Jim. Thank you. You will you will give us your view on the use of IVL in the setting of calcified left main bifurcation stenosis. So what I want to do is to share with you a case of uh, the use of intravascular lithotripsy in the patients with uh, left main bifurcations lesions. We all know that actually there has been a lot of reported cases of the use of IVL in uh, left main, so a lot of which was just case report and perhaps some uh, small registry study. But there are potential advantages of IVL in uh, left main PCI. Number one is that this is an easy therapy to use, no learning curve, you, it's a catheter-based uh, therapy, and so uh, one can easily pick it up and deliver it across the stenosis. Also, when you are dealing with a left main bifurcation lesion, the side branch wire can be maintained throughout the, the uh, IVL, so it is particularly relevant when your side branches sustain a uh, uh, large amount, sub-10 large amount of myocardium. Now, we also know that little tripsy fractures the calcified plaques more than the bladed, so that the occurrence of no reflow phenomenon is actually very uncommon uh, when you use IVL, in particularly left main. And IVL can be used in large vessels, and of course, when you're working in left main, you're frequently dealing with uh, large vessels uh, of four millimeter at least. And actually, one very important fact here is that IVL can be administered in an abbreviated fashion instead of the usual 10 pulses of a per cycle that we are commonly used to. So in times of uh, significant ischemia, where you need to shorten the time of occlusion, particularly in left main, you can actually shorten the pulsing to maybe just five cycles and then break off and come back again later. So this is a 55-year-old Chinese meal. Uh, terrible uh, risk factors here, end-stage renal failure, diabetes, HIV positive, has got peripheral vascular disease, has got cirrhosis with border hypertension and residus, not for transplant, has got atrial fibrillation and warfarin anticoagulation, everything that you can imagine being a high-risk case, he's got it. He's got a previous uh, anterior MI and has got a stent put in in 2011. Two years later, he had got an instant restenosis in the LAD artery that was treated with drug coated balloon. Now he come in. Uh, 10 years later, round about with NSTEMI, and he's got a significant left main stenosis. I will show you EF is impaired at 35%, uh, moderate RV impairment as well. So if you just look at this anatomy, uh, can be pretty scary here because you look at the osteo circumflex stenosis and you can't see anything at the osteum of the LED artery as well. It's almost like a 0 1 1 sort of a distal left main bifurcation. And you can see a trickle of flow down the LED uh, standard segment right here, but not extending to the osteum. 
If you take it that in another view, uh, again, we can see this osteocircumflex stenosis, a very highly calcified uh, LAD artery. And so, uh, so this will be a challenge. Actually, this is probably among the first few of uh, IVL case that I actually use. Uh, 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 use the technology. So this is another view here, very slow flow down the LAD artery. So the initial uh, strategy was to uh, well, do an intravascular ultrasound. I can only do it for the circumflex. I can't do it for the uh, LAD artery, obviously. So you can see that the calcium uh, in the uh, circumflex artery uh, is, is okay. It's not too bad. So, uh, so this part probably we can get away without any sort of ablative therapy and so forth. So now crossing the LED becomes a challenge because uh, of the severe angulation and because it's almost like a uh, chronic total occlusion lesion. So I actually have to use a combination of guide wire to negotiate uh, through this particular lesion. And finally, crossing with a Concrest Pro guide wire into the LED artery. And when this wire crosses, I also have tremendous difficulty in uh, in passing anything. This is almost like an uncrossable lesion here. So uh, no balloon can cross through. So I actually use a, uh, a 2.1 French uh, toner's catheter, which, uh, which may not be commonly used, but just to create a passage for my subsequent uh, sequential inflations with small balloon of 0 0.85 and then go 1, 1.252 and 2, 2.5 finally. So you can imagine the uh, challenges that I'm facing through as I uh, predilate uh, this uh, osteo LAD calcified stenosis. Having achieved some kind of lumen, this is where I put in an iverse to just delineate this uh, osteo LAD stenosis and you can see the severe calcification, but at some point in time, there's already some blockage and, and uh, uh, disruptions of the concentric ring, but you can see that uh, as the iverse catheter come back into the osteum and so forth, uh, the amount of calcium that we are uh, dealing with is, is tremendous. So this is right at the uh, osteum of the LAD artery. So at this point in time, I feel that this balloon uh, dilatation is just not good enough. We, we just need to a, a something else, and this is where I put out the uh, intravascular uh, lithotripsy to actually prepare the lesion better. So I took a 3-0 uh, balloon, and, uh, and actually we supported by a 555 uh, French uh, guideliner uh, because there was trouble delivering this uh, shockwave balloon, even just at, at the ostium of the LAD artery. But nonetheless, I uh, managed to deliver a closet and uh, deliver the full 80 pulses. And this is after IVL. And after IVL, I wasn't, not, well, I wasn't too happy again with the uh, results. And so I, I took a 3-0 non-compliant balloon and go higher. The concept of intravascular lithotripsy is that it cracks the lesions, but it doesn't necessarily break it. So it's not unusual to have a combination of therapy nowadays to modify a calcified plaque. So this is what I did. I did a non-compliant balloon to go higher pressure now. And then uh, now that I'm quite satisfied that I can prepare the, uh, L, uh, the LED well, I decided to go ahead and stand the circumflex uh, using uh, uh, a T technique here with the uh, uh, circumflex being treated first. Uh, this is after stenting of the circumflex artery. This is the uh, immediate results after stenting of the circumflex artery, which looks pretty good. And now I actually pass a uh, stent into the LAD artery using the uh, tap technique here and just uh, making sure that I cover the ostium of the uh, LAD artery. So this is uh, immediately after uh, stenting with a 3020 and uh, going on to high pressure balloon inflations followed by sequential kissing followed by port uh, technique of a 4.5 balloon in the left main. And let's see the uh, final results here. So this is the LAD after the final, the whole series of balloon dilatation, sharp wave and stenting. <clears throat> And let's see the uh, final angiography here. Looks pretty reasonable for the LAD and the circumflex. And this is the uh, final angiography from the uh, spider cord view. And so this is the uh, intravascular ultrasound after the LAD uh, stenting. And I could achieve a MSA of 4.7. You could argue that you know, it's not as good as a 5 uh, that we go for. But this is a very difficult calcified lesions. We have achieved a reasonable, in my opinion, a reasonable uh, a vessel size uh, MSA. And this is a circum circumflex, which is obviously larger. And so just putting in the two uh, side by side, this was the final IBUS result of the ostium of the LAD and circumflex. So the point here is that the use of IVL to treat heavily calcified left main coronary stenosis is feasible. 
and you uh, are oftentimes a company with a high strategy, uh, strategy success rate. Uh, it is possible to use a short IVL cycle to avoid uh, profound ischemia and contribute to a, to a procedural safety. Thank you very much for your attention. Eugene, great case. Thank you so much. Um, I have two questions for you, practical wise again. If we have this uh, scenario of this left main bifurcation stenosis, uh, the distal branches usually are significantly smaller than the left main. But if you want to treat the distal branches and the left main, what size of IVL balloon catheter you use? Let's take you have a 3.5 or 3.0 proximal LAD and a 4.0, left main. What kind of catheter size you choose? So I think you have to decide exactly where the calcium is. So I always size to the reference vessel diameter. So if it's an LED that I'm treating, intravascular imaging is really important because you really need to size the catheter to the size of the vessel. If you take a 2.5 short wave for a 3.0 vessel, you're not going to achieve a full little tripsy results. So take a 3.0 for a so, so intravascular imaging, size according to the reference vessel diameter of the vessel that I'm treating. I think it's important to emphasize that you can even use the larger size of balloon to apply the IVL because, again, this is not a dilatation balloon. It's just an application balloon. But for application, it is essential that the balloon is adjacent to the vessel wall. Other, otherwise, it doesn't work. Now, you told us and we heard about the C2 plus catheter, which now allows us to have 120 pulses. How do you make your planning if you have a calcified distal bifurcation left main scenario where you need to go into LAD and left circumflex artery? So how you make the planning, how much pulses should go where? I think the, uh, the general principle is to deliver the most number of pulses to the most calcified lesions that you want to achieve a good outcome. So, so it's not going to be a one size fits all you have to actually um, determine actually your strategy based on the anatomy and the morphology that you find on intravascular imaging. And, and that's why I also want to emphasize here that it has no one size fit all for calcified stenosis. Even if you use a little tripsy therapy, you actually have to prepare the lesions, maybe with a tonus, maybe with a cutting balloon, maybe with a rotational arthrectomy. And then after the little tripsy, you have to probably continue with things like OPM, which is what I do now. So do you have situations where you have rotor blade, you do an eye shock wave, still not good enough, you take an OPN and finally get the best result of in terms of lesion preparation. So I think there's no one size fits all strategy. Shock wave now becomes a very important armamentarian in our lab uh, for dealing with heavily calcified lesion. My, my, Michael, can I just comment uh, briefly mm -hmm. on that? Okay. And on the practical aspect with the 120 pulses, what we've realized is that's when we don't use all the pulses, but go back because we're doing multi-vessel or going, doing a bifurcation, go back with the balloon, and wherever we don't see that the balloon is adequately dilated, an optimal size balloon post-dilatation is not adequate, bring back the balloon and deliver the remaining pulses at that point. Those are the points which are unforgiving, should we say. For the last few seconds that we have, I would like to ask our panelists, you heard about the technology, about its current status, what would you like to see to improve with that technology? Then I move up uh, and uh, wrap up the session. So, Ashok, you start. Yeah, they're, they're, Marco, they're, you will end. And Eugene, you may join us. So, again. so two, two aspects that we'd like to see beyond extra pulses is deliverability, and the second is longer lengths of balloons uh, to be able to cover longer areas. And I think they're working on both. And then there's a front-end catheter for total occlusions that they're working at, which would be hopefully, which is already undergoing human, uh, first in human studies. I actually want to see three improvement to the current iterations. One is a smaller IVL, so this currently is 2.5. I'd like to see a 2.0. I'd like to see a longer uh, IVL balloon, more than the current 12 millimeter, maybe it's 15, 20. And I'd like to see the increased number of pulses from 80 to at least 120. Uh, and for myself, I would very much see more emitters. Like if you look at the peripheral shortwave balloon, there are a few more emitters to be more effectively cal crack, crack the calcium, modify the calcium. So more emitters for me. Marco? Uh, I think this is not working. 
uh, I, I agree with my colleague. I think more emitters are very important. I used to think that length could increase, but with num increasing the number of pulses, I don't think length is some, uh, too much of a problem because you can move the balloon. Uh, and deliverability has to, to improve. But finally, one thing that no, uh, it's hard to mention, but the prices actually eventually need to go down because uh, that thing that you, 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 he asked to you about uh, different sizes in one vessel, uh, in between a 4.0 and a 3.5 is easy to, ch to choose, but if you have a 4.0 tight left main and a 3.0 or 2.5 uh, LED, you cannot use the same balloon and you, you need to use two different balloons unless you, you're going to not deliver the, uh, well the, 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 the pulses, right? So thank you very much for your opinion. And may I can have up my last slide to wrap up that session. I think that we can say, what, based on what we have heard, that IVL is an effective and safe technology to address all kinds of coronary calcifications, superficial, deep, concentric, eccentric, and nodular, with a favorable ease of use. The new C2 catheter with 50% more pulses allows us to even address more complex calcified lesion scenarios, longer lesions, left main bifurcations, and in particular calcified nodules, as we have seen. And in particular, the pulse management based on interconary imaging is essential at least for complex calcified lesions, as you have also seen. I have to thank all the presenters, my co-facilitators, for joining me in this uh, attractive session, you, the audience, for joining us here. And now it remains me only to say that you will have a continuous educative uh, Asia PCR here in, in Singapore. Thank you so much for joining us here. Thank you.